The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Being a luggage detective, I've always had a knack for detecting luggage. When it came to the baggage handling industry, I didn't take any wooden nickels. The whole thing just felt like a bunch of baloney thought up by some country bumpkin on a toot. It was almost 2 p.m., so I was about to pack up shop and head to the local speakeasy to get fried. Suddenly, some dialed up four flusher walked in. By the looks of her, she came with a lot of baggage. So what's the beef, doll? I ain't got time for jibber jabber. Are you a luggage detective by any chance? The one that solved the Limburg carry-on bag case? That's right, but I gave that life up, see? You're putting a bucket down a dry well, sister. Oh, but you simply must help. You see, I'm a light bulb salesperson. That's a real job? Oh yes, I went to college and everything. Anyway, I fly around all 48 states peddling my light bulb wares, but recently on a flight, my light bulbs became as broken as my heart. <laughs> Is that so? What do you reckon happened to him? I don't rightly know. That's why I came here. You're the great luggage detective, right? I didn't know what to say. I've tried to get beyond my luggage detecting days, but then again, I was down to my last case of scotch. Please help. I simply must know what happens to my luggage when I check it on a plane. Perhaps some sort of data logging device would be preferable. All right, I'll take your case. You will? Well, that's just the bee's knees. All right, just give me your case and I'll do the rest, plus expenses. Here's my case. Thanks, I've taken your case. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Oh, look, I knocked some hot glue loose. Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. So Karen, we need to figure out a way to make something that logs what happens to luggage. Because mm -hmm. who knows what occurs to it. Yeah. We have a bunch of accelerometer dev boards laying around. We got some from Freescale last year. I think we could use one of those and then hook it up to a microcontroller board to create a single package along with an SD card slot. So we could log the data to the SD card into a CSV file, comma separated values. And that could be easily opened with Excel and turned into a bar graph. Oh, okay. And the sensor can also detect orientation. So if this is your luggage and you're dragging it around the airport, that would be, you know, probably a pretty decent position. Or if you're packing it, right? That's usually mm -hmm. what you expect it to be in. But in flight, who knows what happens to it, right? Guy checks it to the next guy. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah it's, yeah, it's like in some cartoon where they're like, you know, they're throwing something to keep it away from Aladdin or whoever. <laughs> that didn't happen in Aladdin. Anyway. <laughs> So it could log the orientation every second and the average X, Y, Z values per second, unless there's a huge spike, yeah. like an impact. Right. Okay, so we can build it into a single unit with a battery pack. Probably two AAs would be enough to power both the controller and the SD card and the uh, sensor, and that would probably last long enough. We can, we can do a test with a multimeter. How much current does this draw? Multiply it by time. That's how long the batteries last. Okay. Cool, and then we can make it so it Velcros into the luggage in the orientation that you want to detect. So basically, its orientation matches the luggage, and then when you're done, you pull it out, you push the button, it closes the file on the SD card, then you can read the results. So yeah, that's the basic plan for the data logging luggage. Anything else going on in today's episode? Yes, Felix is gonna talk to us about Linux operating systems, and we're gonna have a research segment about next week's episode, part two of the mechanical television. Hmm, it'll be fun to finish that project up. But for today, it's the data logger. Let's get started. For luggage detective, we're going to need an accelerometer so we can sense the motion of our detective device. I think an accelerometer is the best way to go because we can detect things like this, you know, increase in the Z and stop. 
right? right? So we can see the forces at work. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're like, you know, just driving to the airport, it's like, you know, mm, zero, increase, constant, decrease. But if a bag is being thrown, boom, right. you'll see a spike and then a drop. What we can do is we can maybe log the data 10 times a second, and then once a minute, take that and write it to EEPROM. Okay. That way, well, if we write to EEPROM just once a minute, then we put all the delays of EEPROM at the one minute mark instead of like every time we try to write. Because mm -hmm. writing to EEPROM can be kind of slow. So an I2C device, we need to talk to this. So have you worked with I2C before? Just a little bit. Not really enough to just go right into it, but definitely want to know more about it. Okay, so let's talk about I2C before we get started with this chip. Okay, Felix, to get you started with I2C, I grabbed a 24LC512 serial EEPROM from Microchip and stuck it on this perf board. Cool. Most of these serial EEPROMs are all I2C, so it's a pretty easy way to get started. Mm -hmm. Really, all you do with them is you either read an address or write an address. All right. Which is pretty much how the accelerometer will work, mm -hmm. but, you know, this, this is an easier way to get started. So let's talk about how to hook one up. Do you have the data sheet there? Yep. So we want to put pull-ups on both the data and clock lines. Right. I squared C has two lines, serial data and serial clock, and you can have up to 128 devices on I squared C bus. All right, 128 devices, I squared C. Possible, I mean, it's usually lower than that uh, because it's a seven bit address. Mm -hmm. So in the case of this, if you look at the data sheet, see how there's three lines that say address? Right. Right, so there'll be a base address for this, which is one one zero one zero mm -hmm. and then the last three bits are set by those pins okay so if you set them all to low your address for this device will be one zero one zero 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 okay so you could in theory have up to eight of these EEPROMs on the same bus and have unique identifiers for each one I see now not every I squared C device is going to have all those identifiers sometimes you can't change the bus address at all sometimes you can only change one bit but in this case you can you know put quite a few of them on yeah, it seems rather flexible. Right, so what happens in the I squared C is the master device will be like, hey, device number, in this case, 50 in hex, wake up. And then the device is like, oh, number 50, that's me. I better wake up and you know mm -hmm. give some data. And all the other devices on the bus will be like, okay, well, I'm not device 50, so I'm just going to stay in tri-state. I'm not gonna do anything. And that's pretty much how it works. So we have all of these in ground. We have power here, uh, our two pull-ups, and then right protect, also we pull to ground. Okay. So let me just connect the ground here. And by putting right protect to ground, Makes Point it so we can write to it? Yes. Okay. It's active low, which means it's write enable. So if you wanted to prevent it from being written, you would pull it high. Okay. Okay, so now we need the data connection. So on this Arduino, which we probably won't use for the actual product, but it's easy for a test. Mm -hmm. The last two lines on the analog here, serial data. Right. And that goes to serial data. And then the last line, A5, is also the I squared C serial clock. Okay. Most microcontrollers, if you look at their data sheets, each pin will have you know three or four different functions, many different things it can do. So right. in this case, these pins can be analog pins or yeah. they can be the I squared C bus. All right, this should work. So can you create some example code? We'll see okay. if we can read and write from the EEPROM and that'll be a good introduction to I squared C. All right. And then we can try the same sort of thing with the Freescale chip. Okay. Here's some example code that we put together of how to read and write the EEPROM with an Arduino. First thing we do need to do is include the EEPROM library. And in our setup, all we're doing is uh, turning on the, the serial monitor. And here is our Arduino loop. And uh, we have a variable here that we probably don't need. Comment that out. So here there are two for loops in our Arduino loop. The first one writes to all the registers in the EEPROM goes from 0 to 256, and then the next reads all those registers from the EEPROM from 0 to 256 with val equals read register count. And here's our increment uh, variable, register count, and then it prints it out to the serial monitor. The dev board has been hooked up to this random Arduino here over the I squared C line so we can get data from it. We actually found a library for this particular accelerometer online, so we're gonna use it just to see if we're getting data. All right, let's see what we got here. 23 Adafruit Metro, I guess is the name of this board. Let's flash it. Now this is going to give us all of the data possible from this board, but there may only be a few things that we actually want for our luggage detective. 
Let's see what we got. Range 2G, all right. What are these numbers? Let's hold this in space and try to figure it out. Okay, the third one looks like uh, Z acceleration. I don't know why its baseline is nine instead of closer to zero like the other ones. Okay, there's Y, see that one? I'm going forward and back. X will be left and right. So that's negative and that's positive. Okay, now I'm gonna see if I can get the tilt data. There's tilt, like which direction it's actually tilted in, and there's acceleration, which is how fast it is getting there. We could use both for luggage detective, although we wanna make sure we're not storing too much data. Okay, let's make this so we get only the data that we really truly want. I'm gonna comment out that. I'm gonna put this back in. Okay, I've added some variables here. Um, new X, new Y, new Z, last, and then tolerance. So the point of this is we're going to compare the new samples to the old samples, and when we see a difference of tolerance, then we log it. And it's only going to report when it actually sees a change. All right, so here it's looking at the three values to see if they've changed since the last loop. And if the flag is set, then, well, for now, we'll just uh, put it in the serial monitor. All right, and looks like we still have the orientation being printed. So let's do this. Let's actually, well, let's just run it as is and see what happens. Don't try to understand them. Just rope, ride, and brand them. Someday, you'll be living high and wide. I'll be here all week. Try the veal. Oh, I'm being very careful with your bag, sir. We take very good care. Whoa! Don't worry, we won't let that happen again. Whoa! Ah, uh, this is the power speaking. I turned back on the seatbelt sign because um, we did some trouble. Turbulence, uh, turbulence up ahead. Uh, please return to your seat. So we need to find a good tolerant range where normal motion, you know, like careful motion, like that you would actually handle your bags with doesn't trigger it, but violence does. See how the numbers only change when something bad happens? Um, one thing about this though is if we do it like that where it only triggers on a major change, then we won't actually know the time between events because I'm not gonna put a real time clock in this thing. I think that's just a little too much. So what we could do instead is we could um, take like 10 samples a second, and then if something happens, then we log it. That way the data is at a consistent length and we can actually see where the spikes happen. So if you're you know, going on a trip, you're like, okay, that's me dropping off my bag. Oh my God, look what they did. All right, now it's on the plane. Oh no, look what they did. And now I picked up my bag. You know, you could actually see change over time. I'm gonna update this to just show about 10 samples a second with the orientation. So I'll be right back. It's time for Felix's Corner. Well, welcome back to Felix's Corner. Today, I'm going to embark on a informational series on operating systems, more specifically, Linux-based operating systems. I'm gonna to explain to you what I mean when I say Linux, what I mean when I say distribution, and I'm gonna introduce some things to you like GNU, which is like, what is that, GNU slash Linux? Anyway, I'll get into that. I'm gonna talk about why me, as a person who generally likes to be in a Linux-based environment, goes into a Windows-based environment. As you may have seen in some of the episodes, I have a tendency to operate machines that are not Linux, and some of you were kind of taken aback by that, but I'll explain to you why. First, I'll give you a, a, a brief history on my introduction to Linux. I think it was, 2003 or 4. Wow, can't believe it's been that long. A friend of mine, he said, hey, try Ubuntu, because he's, you know, computer engineering guy or computer science guy. He said, try this Ubuntu. So I downloaded it and saw it, and I was like, I, don't, I, you know, I just scratched my head and went back to XP. And then a while went by, and I tried it again. I said, I don't know what's going on here. I, I, I purchased a uh, Linux magazine CD or something. It had a disk of OpenSUSE in it. And that was kind of right around the time that probably Windows Vista, I think, was released. And uh, I didn't really have the money for a Mac. So I said, I'm going to try this OpenSUSE disk. And so I installed it on this really old, ancient machine. I was actually able to I, get into it. I was like, wow, this is cool. This is really great. And so OpenSUSE was my first real introduction to uh, a Linux-based operating system. So I just want to mention that here. Let's get this cute little lizard as a, as a mascot. Back then, OpenSUSE was, uh, had a KDE environment, but that was the closest thing to a Windows environment, whereas Ubuntu was running GNOME. Then I don't even know if GNOME is an acronym or any Genome, GNOME, I don't know, there's a bunch of different ways to say it. Whatever. GNOME, right? And GNOME was quite a bit different to me, in my in my 
uh, perspective anyhow. So that kind of turned me off of Ubuntu at first, but then OpenSUSE got me in. And then I, I, my, I was like, okay, well now, after I figured out some stuff, I went to Ubuntu, and then I actually ended up liking GNOME. Until Ubuntu started throwing all this other weird stuff, like Unity, and then I, I, I couldn't really follow it anymore. I mean, like I could, but I just I just didn't like it. So then I migrated from Ubuntu to Debian because like Ubuntu rose from Debian, which Debian is pretty cool. I really like Debian because it took a little bit more effort to install than OpenSUSE or Ubuntu. And then I had this buddy. Um, he goes by the name The Great Nafu, and he's a real cool fella. And he introduced me to Fedora. He said, oh, Fedora is really great. You got to do Fedora. So I tried Fedora for a while, and I couldn't really get into Fedora, but I like it. I appreciate Fedora. And I actually have a little bit more admiration for Fedora than Ubuntu. I don't want to get into that, but yeah, anyhow. So some time went by, and I, I felt abandoned by Ubuntu, and Fedora was a little too... I just couldn't get into Fedora. And Debian was, it was great, but uh, I wanted something a little more raw. First, I tried, um, let me find this, um, Linux from scratch. I think it's really cool. I haven't really gotten too far with it, but the Linux from scratch project, it basically, it's an instruction manual how to go from the raw source code of everything and compile everything and configure everything into a working operating system. It's kind of like building a car, right? Or carving a canoe from, from a tree trunk. Really, yeah, I, I think I would compare it to that. But um, that was a little, little much for me. And then I suddenly I found an operating system called Arch Linux, and mm, mm, yeah, I really like that. Um, it worked out great for me. I, I really what Arch Linux is, it's not so much of an operating system as it is kind of like the Linux from scratch. It's more like an instruction manual on how to set up an operating system, except in this case, it doesn't require compiling everything from source code. There's a large repository with a bunch of stuff already compiled. And um, see, there's a, there's a beginner's guide here and an installation guide, and it has all the steps necessary in order to download, install, and configure an operating system based off of um, this repository, which I found to be the most satisfying for me. And now, back to the build. Okay, I made a drawing of the six positions the luggage could be in along with the accompanying text for it. So it's just like a pair of dice. There's one, two, three, four, five, six different states it can be in. So instead of printing out text, I'll actually just put a number on each line of data so it'll be the position of the luggage and then the X, Y, Z forces on it. That is what will capture at least 10 times a second and log to a file. And if we put it onto a text file, or if we call it a CSV file, we can actually make it easily importable into uh, Microsoft Excel. I need to desolder the headers that happen to be on this microcontroller dev board. Once I've done that, I can attach the SD card slot manually to the back of it. SD card is pretty easy. It's basically a spy interface, which is three wires plus one extra wire for chip select. This is one of our custom AVR dev boards, although we're quite low on them. I should reorder that soon. Hey, that could be an episode idea. Design a new board. I'm gonna stick this SD card onto the back of it like so, and wire it up with the pull-up resistors that it will need to connect to the microcontroller. I will then add a capacitor and test everything out to make sure the card is connected before I add the accelerometer. And then finally, I'll add the battery pack and a switch. So I want everything to be fairly compact, probably, you know, about like this. And then this, whatever we build it into, probably a 3D printed part, this will stick inside your bag in a certain orientation, so it will give you the number based off how your bag was oriented. So you don't just toss it in your bag willy-nilly, you're like sticking it in your bag. Like, okay, this will tell me where my bag was. Like with Velcro or something, so it won't move. Although, let's face it, I'm sure a baggage handler could cause Velcro to come loose. I'm gonna solder this in place using some of the metal tabs on the end, and then I'll start wiring it up. Even though we're not using all of the data lines on the SD card, we still have to pull them all up with a 10K pull-up resistor. I am using surface mount resistors for this because they are smaller and easier to fit into the project. We also need to attach power and ground. I've combined everything together into a unit as small as possible. Full-size SD card, basically because 
Most of my older SD cards are full size, so I wanted to use them up. Wired up the pull-ups and everything needed on the SD card. Uh, Spy mode in SD card only requires four lines. MISO, MOSI, CLOCK, and SHIP SELECT. But the unused lines you still have to pull high in order to make it work. SD cards have two modes, SPI mode and then also 4-bit mode. But 4-bit mode is usually only reserved for you know camera use and whatnot. I think you're actually supposed to use a license with 4-bit mode as well. Whereas SPI mode is slower but really easy to use. And on this side, I built in the accelerometer. So it's got power and ground and then the I squared C lines going up here. And there are pull-up resistors for those. They're just hidden under the board. I wanted everything to be nice and flat. Also added an electrolytic capacitor because this is gonna be battery powered. I'm gonna probably build an enclosure for this. Maybe something like this, you know, where it's in a line. Eh, something like this would probably work. That way you can still program it and get at the SD card here. And then this would clip inside your luggage like this. So the orientations would be like, you know, this is good, this is good, anything else is bad. All right, I 3D printed a case. It will hold the unit along with the battery pack and you can still access the SD card at the top. It's nothing too fancy, but it should get the job done. So I have the switch directly on the battery tab. That way, if you turn this off, you can still power it externally with a serial port connector. And I 3D printed a little button, which I seem to have lost. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I tested it on the multimeter. It's about 72 milliamps. We have 1800 milliamp hours with AAs, which gives us about 25 hours of runtime. That should be enough for even the longest flight because a flight would never really be longer than that unless you went around the world for some reason, which doesn't make any sense because you know, you're only halfway across the world from anywhere else. Anyway, I'm going to start buttoning this back up. I made a little light pipe for the LED, but I, I think it actually blocks light more than it transmits it, so we don't really need that. I made a little boot up button here, so if you hold the button while you're turning it on, you will be in serial port mode, else it will log to the SD. I think I'm gonna use this elastic to close the case. It doesn't have to be that good looking, just has to work. Time to do a test. So here's the luggage detective. I'm gonna switch it on and it'll start recording the data. Light will blink twice, blink, 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 okay. It is now recording. I'm gonna put it inside the luggage. Actually, I should put it inside the luggage and then turn it on. There we go. All right, now it's starting its recording journey. Time to pack for the trip. Ben Heck Show shirts. Oh, this is one of those extended bags, isn't it? I'm gonna let it log this position for a while. Okay, now to simulate a trip to the airport. Somebody once told me the world is gonna throw me. Check it out, I'm a taxi cab driver who doesn't give a crap. I'm going to crush you, Max. I am Rhino. Well, I don't have an airplane, unfortunately, but I'll try to simulate what it's like. My neighbors are gonna think I'm drunk. Oh no, turbulence! Oh, a pothole, let's hit that. Boy, that was some flight. I watched three movies. Now, here's the baggage handler. Ah, yeah, where's this going? Texas, uh, whatever. Oh, then now it goes on to the, uh, what's it called? The carousel. And then here's like, nope, not my bag. Nope, not my bag. Oh, it's my bag. Well, that was a great trip. Now let's take a look at the data. Now you're at your hotel and wondering what happened to my bag? Oh man, good thing I have the luggage detective. So we're gonna pull it out, tap the button once, and that ends the recording. Switch it off, and now we can look at the data. Since I gave the file a CSV extension, it will open directly into Excel as a comma separated value. Okay, so this is the second number. This is the orientation. We just did it with text. Here's the X, Y, Z acceleration, and this is the flag column. Okay, so if I want to make a graph, I can select three of these here and just, I don't know, select a graph. Uh, yeah, let's try this one. All right, okay, so. This is over time. Again, this is uh, one sample a second. So this is one minute, 
two minutes, three minutes. So these two events here are probably when I threw it violently in the back of my car. And we actually shot that twice, which is why there's two of them. So we can see this is the impact here. And then I pulled it out of the car and then threw it back in here. And here you see it's fairly steady with some rises and falls. That is probably when I was driving my car around in circles and trying to hit every pothole. Then here at the end, this is um, me pulling it out of the car, throwing it on the ground a couple times, picking it up a couple times and seeing if it was my bag. And then at the end, this is when it was sitting on the table when we actually pulled the unit out. As you can see, hardly anything happened to it at all until the final motion of me pulling it out and then stopping the data logging. So yeah, this gives us a pretty good indication of what happened to the bag over time. And since it's only one sample a second, that means we could actually record a, you know, like a five or six hour flight and still not have a ridiculous amount of data. So for each second, we average out 10 samples per second, unless there's a very big change, in which case we log the change. Because if we recorded 10 samples a second, you know, we'd have 10 times the data and that would get a little unwieldy. So yeah, looks like it worked out pretty well. I mean, I'm not really a chart expert with Excel, but, uh, you know, there it is, a visualization of what happened to the bag. But this goes to show, I mean, it's pretty easy to use a microcontroller to log data onto an SD card. And as long as you put commas between the values, it can be easily separated by a program like Excel. So we could use this data for all sorts of things. So if you have some sort of data logging project that you'd like to do, hopefully this is a good inspiration for you. Now it's time for a research update. So in the mechanical TV episode, I tested it out using photoresistors, which change resistance based off the level of light. However, I'm not sure those are gonna be fast enough when we actually go to create the imaging device. So I'm looking on Newark Element 14 to see if I can find photodiodes. They will do the same thing, but they will react much faster to light. Uh, got a couple in the mail. I'm gonna try them out and hopefully this will give us a fast enough response that we can recreate the image properly when we go to finish the mechanical television project. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode. However, we are going to be doing a follow-up on The Luggage Detective. Later in April, Backflip Films is going to be traveling to Vegas for an event and they'll be having a lot of checked bags with them. So they're going to put this inside and actually get data from the baggage handlers and the flight. So we'll show you what actual readings we found. Have you ever created a device to help you while traveling? Or have you ever created a device that logs data? Let us know on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. And you can also go there to read about our other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Well, what did you discover? Did you crack the case? I did. I assembled a device that logs the orientation of your luggage once per second. Oh, that sounds marvelous. It also samples the XYZ acceleration forces, averages those out 10 times a second, and logs that data as well. It's better than I could have ever dreamed. The data is saved to an SD card in CSV format. Afterwards, the data can be loaded into Microsoft Excel so you can create a bar graph seeing exactly what happened to your precious luggage. And your conclusion? Well, what happened was you put a bunch of light bulbs into your suitcase with no padding. What'd you think was gonna happen? Well, I'll go right out and buy some bubble wrap then. Thank you, luggage detective. Help. So the next time you pick up a bag and improperly handle it, think again, because the luggage detective is always on the case. I'm failing your father's class. <laughs> <laughs>don't try to understand them. Why am I singing that song? Why is it in my head? 20% off with your sweet Dickens card. <laughs> you see, I'm a light bulb salesperson. <laughs> Maybe I could do an impression of Sarah Palin. I didn't, no, I couldn't, I couldn't. And then when you open it, kind of be caressing them like <laughs> <laughs> Now let's do that. Please help. I simply must know what's going to make me laugh at myself. Two, one, snacks, I'm going to record in just a moment. There he is, for his snacks recording. I'm looking at the camera saying, hello, everybody, what's going on over there? The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. <laughs>